supply mission arrives at the space station, a closer look at Dwarf Planet series, and the Parker Solar Probe is ready for the heat. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. The SpaceX Dragon cargo spacecraft arrived at the International Space Station on July 2nd, three days after being launched from Florida. The Dragon delivered more than 5,900 pounds of research, crew supplies, and hardware to the orbiting laboratory. After about a month, it will return to Earth with about 3,800 pounds of cargo and research, including investigations on DNA sequencing and cancer therapy. Since being dropped into its final and lowest ever orbit, about 22 miles above the surface of dwarf planet Ceres, our Dawn spacecraft has been returning thousands of stunning images and data. The low altitude observations will help shed new light on the origin of the materials found across the surface of Ceres, including the largest deposits of carbonates observed thus far outside Earth and possibly Mars. This animation demonstrates how deformation in the icy surface of Europa could transport subsurface ocean water to the Moon's surface. This is just one of several simulated behaviors reported in a new study performed by scientists at our Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The study focused on linear features called bands and groove lanes found on Jupiter's moons Europa and Ganymede. Scientists have used the same numerical model to solve mysteries about motion in Earth's crust. Our Parker Solar Probe spacecraft has been outfitted with the revolutionary heat shield designed to protect it from the extreme temperatures it will encounter on its historic mission to the sun. At closest approach, the spacecraft will pass within 4 million miles of the sun's surface, where temperatures reach nearly 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. But the heat shield is made from materials that will keep everything within its shadow to about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. The mission is targeted to launch in August. A new study using data from our New Star Space Telescope shows that Eta Carina, the most luminous and massive stellar system within 10,000 light years, is accelerating particles to high energies, some of which may reach Earth as cosmic rays. Located about 7,500 light years away, the system contains a pair of massive stars whose eccentric orbits bring them unusually close every 5.5 years. They pass about 140 million miles apart at their closest approach, about the average distance separating Mars and the Sun. Researchers are looking for more data from citizen scientists to help track mosquitoes known to carry and spread diseases like Zika, West Nile virus, and malaria. These data are combined with NASA Earth satellite observations to create new forecast models that can predict the spread of mosquito-carrying diseases. You can help track mosquitoes by downloading the Globe Observer app from your device's app store and then collect data over the summer using the Mosquito Habitat Mapper tool in the app. That's what's up this week in NASA. For more on these and other stories, follow us on the web at nasa.gov slash twan. What is eutrophication? It's a problem that should matter to you whether you live near the ocean or not. That's because it begins wherever people live and ends with damage to resources we all use and enjoy. It all starts when nutrients get into lakes and oceans. Remember, what's waste to humans can be food to plants and other creatures. Nutrients feed algae like they do other plants. Algae grows and blocks sunlight. Plants die without sunlight. Eventually, the algae dies too. Bacteria digest the dead plants, using up remaining oxygen and giving off carbon dioxide. If they can't swim away, fish and other wildlife become unhealthy or die without oxygen. But it doesn't have to be this way. Protecting marine resources starts with sound agricultural and waste management practices.
A maritime forest is a forest that is on the coast and is influenced by sea spray. You start with vegetation like shrubbery that, that is a little salt tolerant. As you get further from the ocean, you'll start getting larger and larger trees that protect the trees behind them. These areas are not found very many places up and down the coast, so they're kind of an oasis for wildlife. You'll find freshwater swamp, maple swamp forest in the middle of the reserve. You're never more than half a mile from the ocean, but the changes in habitat are pretty impressive. Many years ago, the entire Barrier Island would have been covered with forests just like these. Over time, the areas have been developed for houses and commercial development. Barrier islands migrate, and when the island itself moves, the trees can't move. So as the island moves, the trees are left eventually in a changing habitat, and you can see that with the stumps that are present on the beach. Maritime forests are important for coastal resilience. They stabilize the shoreline, they provide filtering effects, shelter for the marsh behind the maritime forest, and just stabilize the whole region. I think it's important to have areas like this preserved for people to be able to see what the islands were like before they were developed, provide that outdoor laboratory, that educational space to take school kids and to do research. Back again with four awesome discoveries you probably didn't hear about this week. When there's damage in tightly packed DNA called heterochromatin, the world's tiniest first responders spring into action. New research on fruit flies and mice reveals when DNA strands are broken, the cell prompts a series of threads, nuclear actin filaments, to form a temporary highway. Then come the paramedics, myosins, walking two-legged molecules that take the injured DNA along the highway to an emergency room at the edge of the nucleus for treatment. This study reveals more about DNA damage and repair, which impacts aging and diseases like cancer. Now to a muddy African river, where scientists say there are fish who have developed a unique bioelectric security system. Through a special protein, they generate electrical pulses so brief, just a few tenths of a thousandth of a second, they can navigate while eluding the detection system of predatory catfish. That same protein is found in human hearts and muscles, and the evolutionary trick the fish use to produce such a brief electrical spurt could provide insights for the treatment of epilepsy and migraines. Warming ocean temps can cause coral bleaching, but coral lavores make it worse. Coral lavores, like sea stars and sea snails, are animals that feed on corals. A new study found that removing the sea snails gave brain corals in the Florida Keys a fighting chance, 50% less bleaching and near complete recovery. This study shows local conservation efforts can have an impact. It's about the size of a Lego minifigure's footprint, and it uses about 1,700 times less energy than this 40-watt light bulb. Meet Navian a tiny new computer chip for drone navigation. Think much smaller drones. The researchers say the chip can be integrated into drones as small as a fingernail to help the vehicles navigate for long stretches on limited power, even in places where GPS isn't available, and even in medical devices like a pill you swallow that can navigate in your body. That'll make medical procedures an easier pill to swallow. And there you go. See you next time with four more awesome discoveries with funding from NSF. When an emergency occurs, it's too late to start planning a response. How do you plan for the unexpected? The first 48 hours is critical. Whether it's stopping a disease outbreak or preventing injury and death, you have to start to plan before the emergency occurs. And when it hits, act fast. The ability of your emergency response plan to sustain and succeed in any emergency is dependent on the strength and depth of its roots. A clearly defined chain of command and organizational structure, effective resource management, and advanced planning are important aspects of an emergency response. 
An Incident Management System, or IMS, is an internationally recognized model based on these principles. IMS provides the root structure needed to grow your emergency response plan and make it strong enough to withstand natural disasters, disease outbreaks, or any hazard. An Emergency Operations Center, or EOC, is the place from which you run your incident management system. The EOC is where you collect information, make decisions about priorities, and coordinate action and communication. EOCs can expand as the response unfolds and scale down as the emergency is under control. EOCs can be big or small, complex or simple, implemented just as effectively in rural as in urban settings. EOCs are necessary and achievable. Simply put, an EOC and any function within it is people, systems, and things. And of the three, the people and systems are the most important elements. For example, you have some people doing contact tracing, others to analyze the data that's collected. You have systems that detail how and when contact tracing is conducted and how the information is shared during staff meetings. And you have things such as trucks or cars that contact tracing staff use to get around. The personal protective gear they may wear when talking to people within a home and the printers used to transmit the data back to the EOC. Incident management systems implemented as part of an emergency operations center follow an established structure. Following this structure, you can move quickly from planning to using your EOC, which is the key to being effective in your response. There are five basic steps to help get your EOC set up and ready to use. With that in mind, first, ensure that you have the laws and authorities in place to carry out public health emergency activities. Second, identify the personnel who represent the major functions for your area or across areas, including in particular rapid response teams, which can be deployed as needed to particular areas. These teams can be comprised of epidemiologists or disease surveillance specialists, laboratorians, and others, depending on the needs and scope of the mission. Third, identify a location, which may depend on the size of your response or the space you have available to you. And build out, whether it be from a warehouse or as simple as a storage cabinet, whatever infrastructure is needed, such as computer networks and secure communication equipment, as well as transportation. Fourth, use existing training resources, such as the World Health Organization's Framework for Public Health Emergency Operations Centers, or trainers from CDC to develop standard operating procedures or systems to run your operation. Then, train on a routine basis, using exercises for various scenarios to keep skills and familiarity with systems routine, so that when the time comes to activate the EOC, staff can quickly move into action. Making use of the experiences and lessons learned to correct and customize plans and SOPs, filling gaps where needed. What an EOC does is make sure that all the various activities and stakeholders affected by outbreaks and emergencies work in sync. Making sure that information and data are shared efficiently and quickly in a coordinated manner. Communicating essential information to partners and stakeholders. Having an EOC structure in place as part of a country's incident management system provides an invaluable head start in heading off a public health disaster. For example, in Nigeria, the country was able to utilize resources devoted to another EOC, one focused on polio, and quickly bring together skilled public health personnel under an EOC devoted to the Ebola outbreak. This allowed teams and stakeholders to interface quickly and efficiently, preventing isolation of individual response elements. For example, staff conducting contact tracing upon identifying a symptomatic contact would call into the EOC and a case management team, ambulance, and decontamination team would be deployed, getting the patient quickly into isolation while the contact tracing team moved to list new and existing contacts of the affected individual. This type of rapid response and coordinated action played a critical role in containing Ebola's spread, even among the densely populated areas of Nigeria. CDC is committed to providing training for those who want to establish an EOC. The investment can be minimal. The benefits are priceless.
Hi, I'm Robert Wilkie. I'm visiting the National Safety Council's Prescribed to Death Opioid Memorial. The memorial is currently located here at the White House. It's part of President Trump's initiative to stop opioid abuse and reduce drug supply and demand. Inside, 22,000 faces are engraved on small white pills. Each symbolizes the tragic story of an American lost to prescription opioid overdose. Some are veterans, veterans who defended this nation with courage and honor. Many veterans have survived serious battlefield wounds, and some endure pain for months, for years, and even for the rest of their lives. In fact, nearly 60% who served in the Middle East and more than 50% of older veterans live with some form of chronic pain. And we have to provide them, and all Americans, safe, effective pain management that lets them live fulfilling lives. For more than a decade now, the Department of Veterans Affairs has been doing just that. In just the last four years, we've reduced opioid use by over 41% among veterans we serve. We've established evidence-based collaborative approaches, ways to manage pain more safely and effectively, while minimizing reliance on opioids. We're improving the effectiveness of our pain management teams and expanding treatment options at every facility. We're coordinating with community care providers to ensure prescriptions are managed as safely as possible. We've issued the life-saving drug Noxaline to over 100,000 veterans to help prevent tragedies. Our opioid therapy risk report provides detailed information on risk factors and helps clinicians design effective pain management and treatment plans. And we're bringing the power of big data analytics to bear, as well as VA's stratification tool for opioid risk mitigation, STORM for short, that puts predictive analytics in the hands of providers. STORM estimates overdose or suicide risk among veterans using or considering opioid therapy, and it offers risk reduction interventions and non-opioid options. VA clinicians are giving extra attention to veterans at risk of tragic outcomes. Treating pain is complex, but as President Trump said, we can be the generation that ends the opioid epidemic. He's right, and the VA is helping lead the way. Thank you, and God bless all who have served. I'm six years old and I'm in first grade. I like going to school, but some days I have to miss school. Sometimes my asthma is bad or I just need to rest. My mom always tries her best, but sometimes I have to miss school because things don't always go as planned. If I miss too many days of school, I probably won't be able to read, write, or do math like my friends. When I miss school for any reason, even if it's excused, it can be hard for me to catch up to my friends. And when I try to make up work at home, it's not the same as learning from my teachers and friends in class. If I keep missing school days, I might fail a grade or even worse, I might not graduate. elementary school now, but when I get bigger, I will go to high school. And the less I'm absent now, the better I'll do in school later. Mommy has big dreams for me, and so do I. When I'm in school every day, I can stay on track, keep up with my friends, and I'll be ready for fourth grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade, and more. My mommy can help make sure I don't miss too many days now so I can make her proud and do well in school. I know sometimes it's not easy, but my mom is doing her best to help me succeed.
Tracing the source of a cosmic phenomenon, the sound of plasma waves in space, and X-ray exploration of the Eagle Nebula. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. For the first time ever, our Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope has found the source of a high-energy neutrino from outside our galaxy. High-energy neutrinos are hard-to-catch particles that are believed to be created by the most powerful events in the cosmos, like galaxy mergers and material falling onto supermassive black holes. Fermi traced this neutrino back to a blast of gamma-ray light from a distant supermassive black hole in the constellation Orion. It traveled 3.7 billion years at nearly light speed before being detected by an international team of scientists using the National Science Foundation's Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. That's the sound of plasma waves moving between Saturn and its moon Enceladus. During its final orbits around the planet, our Cassini spacecraft observed for the first time that the plasma waves travel on magnetic field lines that are like an electrical circuit connecting Saturn and Enceladus. Researchers converted the recording of the plasma into this audio file that we can hear in the same way that a radio translates electromagnetic waves into music. The recording was time compressed from 16 minutes to 28.5 seconds. This new composite image of the Pillars of Creation, the spectacular star-forming region of the Eagle Nebula, about 5,700 light-years from Earth, combines X-ray data from our Chandra X-ray Observatory and optical data from the Hubble Space Telescope. Chandra's unique ability to resolve and locate X-ray sources made it possible to identify hundreds of very young stars, and those still in the process of forming, known as protostars. On July 10th, we announced the six women and men selected as the agency's newest flight directors. After extensive training, the new flight directors will oversee a variety of human missions involving the International Space Station, including flights on American-made commercial crew spacecraft, as well as missions to the moon and beyond with our Orion spacecraft. An unpiloted Russian Progress cargo spacecraft loaded with almost three tons of supplies arrived at the International Space Station on July 9th at 9.31 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, less than four hours after being launched from Kazakhstan. The spacecraft's fast-track trip to the station demonstrated an expedited capability that may be used on future Russian cargo and crew launches. The Progress will remain docked to the station until late January 2019. That's what's up this week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, follow us on the web at nasa.gov slash twan. What is human trafficking? Human trafficking is modern day slavery. It is the exploitation of a person through force, fraud, or coercion. Human smuggling and human trafficking are different crimes. Human smuggling is the illegal movement of someone across a border. Human trafficking is the illegal exploitation of a person. Human trafficking is about exploitation, not transportation. Human trafficking is a highly profitable crime and a violation of human rights. It occurs in every part of the world, including here in the United States. It happens in our big cities our suburbs, and even in rural towns. It can happen to anyone. Human trafficking victims can be U.S. citizens or from other countries. Victims can be any age, race, or gender. But one thing they share is that they are vulnerable to being exploited. There are different types of human trafficking, including sex trafficking, forced labor, and domestic servitude. Sex trafficking victims are manipulated or forced against their will to engage in sex acts for money. Sex traffickers might use violence, threats, manipulation, or the promise of love and affection to lure victims. Truck stops, hotel rooms, rest areas, street corners, clubs, private residences. These are just some of the places where victims are forced to sell sex. 
any person under the age of 18 involved in a commercial sex act is considered a victim of human trafficking. No exceptions. Forced labor takes on many forms, and it happens here in the U.S. and overseas. Through forced fraud or coercion, victims are made to work for little or no pay. Very often, these victims are forced to manufacture or grow the products that we use and consume every day. Victims of forced labor can be found in factories, on farms, doing construction work, and more. Victims of domestic servitude are hidden in plain sight, forced to work in homes across the United States. Their traffickers sometimes take their identification papers and travel documents in order to limit their freedom. They are prisoners, working as nannies, maids, or domestic help. Every year in the United States, thousands of human trafficking cases are reported, but many more go unnoticed. That's because human trafficking is a hidden crime. Victims might be afraid to come forward, or we may not recognize the signs, even if it's happening right in front of us. We need to bring this crime out of the shadows. That's why the Department of Homeland Security created the Blue Campaign, to take a stand against modern-day slavery and help combat this heinous crime by raising awareness of human trafficking around the country. But we can't do it alone. We need your help. So what can you do to stop human trafficking? Visit the Blue Campaign website to learn more about the signs and indicators of human trafficking. Share this video on social media to help bring this crime out of the shadows. Be an informed consumer. Know who makes the products you buy and the food you eat to help keep slavery-tainted items out of your home. And finally, recognize and report suspected human trafficking. You can submit a tip to federal law enforcement online or by phone. For victim support, you can call or text the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. Help us bring this crime out of the shadows and into the light. Join the Blue Campaign. One voice one mission, end human trafficking.